Putting up to it, it's important we look at the facts. Yeah. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another Planet Hollywood. I'm Paul Hutchin, political editor of The Daily Record. Joining me this week are guests Hannah Roger, who's chief reporter of the Sunday Mail, and Douglas Dickey, who is content editor of the Scottish Daily Express. So after a comparatively quiet couple of weeks, the story that has dominated Scottish politics for months is back with a vengeance. That is the police investigation into SNP finances. We had the arrest on Sunday of Nicola Sturgeon, who has been Scotland's longest serving First Minister. Uh, That was between 2014 and 2023. And she was, of course, released without charge pending further investigation. So um, this has triggered a debate uh, inside and outside the SNP and whether Nicola Sturgeon should be suspended have the whip withdrawn, uh, whether she should um, uh, quit the party voluntarily. Um, Hannah, starting with you, um, what did you make of the arrest and what is your view on this debate on the next steps for Nicola? Well, right, see, before we get into all this, I tend to have a habit when I'm on here of comparing the week's events to some sort of film, and I'm going to do that again for this week. So my theme for this week is the empire strikes back. That is what I feel like is going on this week. We've got Boris Johnson going off as not, and then we've got Nicola Sturgeon obviously coming out all guns blazing, saying I am innocent and I've done nothing wrong and I will not be stepping down. So that is my theme of the week, um, just in case you were wondering. But uh, what was your original question? What did I make? Yeah, what would you make of the arrest? And, you know, should she stay? Should she go? Well, I think the arrest was inevitable, inevitable given, um, you know, what has been happening with the investigation thus far. Obviously, we've spoken about it before. We've got three names on those accounts, Colin Beattie, Peter Morell and Nicola Sturgeon. So, you know, in my view, anybody with a brain can see that really... If it's if it's going to happen to two of them, then it'll happen to the third one, regardless of who it is. Um, I do think that it's interesting that she was the last to be arrested. I think it's interesting that she was questioned for a much shorter period of time, it seems, than the other two. Um, I also think that the way the communications around her arrest uh, were handled appeared to be slightly different than the other two. Um, in the sense that she was arrested, I think, at 10 in the morning, but that was only announced by the police four hours later, which, you know, I'm pretty sure with Peter Morell and with Colin Beattie, it was a quite quite a quick announcement, whereas, you know, um, with Nicola Sturgeon, it certainly was not the case, because it was almost like as soon as she, as soon as we found out she was arrested, you know, it was only a couple of hours before she'd been released. And again, I think she was released, but taken to... You know, she wasn't taken back to her house. She was taken to some secret squirrel location. Um, But, you know, in terms of what this means for the SNP, I think Hamza has been dealt an absolute uh, beep show um, with this whole caper. And I think actually, you know, what Nicola Sturgeon, I think, should do is she should remove herself from the SNP while this is going on, um, because really her arrest and all these questions about the suspension and calls from even within the SNP to suspend her, it's just not doing the party any good at all. It's damaging their reputation. And I think as somebody who, you know, clearly has given her life to the SNP, I'm pretty sure she would not want the party's reputation to be damaged in such a way. and also the fact that she maintains that she is innocent, which she's entitled to do. She maintains that she's done absolutely nothing wrong. So therefore you think, well, if she removes herself from the SNP now, this will all be sorted out and then she can rejoin and that's fine. Um, you know, and it would certainly remove a lot of those awkward questions that Hamza Yusuf has been facing and will continue to face this week. And, you know, 
going forward. But that that's just my opinion. I don't know what you guys think about it. Dougie, just to go on what should happen to Nicola, if anything. Now, if you go back to the the Salmond case, by that I mean the Scottish Government investigation into sexual harassment claims, he decided to leave the SNP, and I think there was a line in a statement from the Times saying that he didn't want to give opposition parties attack lines. Now, Nicola Sturgeon is a very astute politician. I mean, do you agree with Hannah that she'd be doing the SNP a favour, Hamza a favour, by actually taking herself out of the picture just now? Well, I think, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, Paul, I don't think there's any doubt at all she'd be doing Humza a favour. Um, Humza's certainly doing her a favour by not suspending her. So um, perhaps she might be thinking about returning the favour. Um, I, I, I mean, the whole thing is just completely remarkable. I, I, I was actually away at the weekend when news of this broke and it was, you know, kind of the talk of the steamy, um, even down at a, you know, music festival kind of thing. Um, I mean, I think Hannah's absolutely right. I think she should remove herself. Um, I, I, I don't see any good from an SNP point of view coming from this. Uh, and if she doesn't, you, you know, pre President suggests that Humza Yusuf should take the decision out of her hand, uh, out of her hands. I think, you know, the question I would ask is, would Nicola suspend Nicola? If, if, mm. if something like uh, if something like this happened with another SNP um, uh, politician, and the answer to that is yeah, she would because she's done it, you know, so many times in the past. But it, it, it's just another, uh, you know, another rather sorry episode. To be honest, uh, um, I, I thought the statement was quite. I, I mean, it's absolutely her right, of course, uh, to say she's done nothing wrong. But I, th I, I, I thought given. You know, the situation she's in right now was quite a um, astounding statement to make. Um, but of course, you, uh, you know, like everyone else, she has a, a, you know, an assumption of innocence until proven otherwise. But then so did, you know, so did Michelle Thompson and, um, you know, Margaret Ferrer. Obviously, obviously, it's a bit different for her now. These guys all had assumptions of innocence until proven otherwise. Uh, and yet they were all suspended. Maybe Ferrer's a bit different because she originally owned up to it before, before trying to deny it in court. But... Uh, and eventually admitting to it again, but yeah, I, I, I mean, no, but for me, no good at all comes from Nicola Sturgeon staying in the SNP for any, you know, for anyone other than the opposition. So, you know, from a Scottish Daily Express point of view, yeah, let's, you know, keep her there. But I'm just thinking about the, the, um, the, you know, the circus it's going to be when she returns to Holyrood. I, I mean, what's that going to be like for? her and for her party, it's going to be an absolute S show. So, yeah, I mean, she absolutely, I'm, 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 I actually think she will stand down uh, as an as an MSP, probably, um, certainly before the next holiday election, and I think maybe, maybe before the end of the year. Hannah, just on the Michelle Thompson case, she was obviously one of the MSPs who said that in the interest of consistency, Nicola Sturgeon should um, stand down. That was obviously in relation to her own uh, treatment, I think back in 2015, um, where she lost the whip after there were stories about property dealings. Do you think that case makes it difficult for Nicola to hang on? It maybe it looks like one rule for um, you know, uh, MPs with a, a low profile and then one rule for, for favoured daughters like Nicola Sturgeon? Well, absolutely. I mean, Michelle Thompson is a good example, but also, you know, we could talk about um, Natalie McGarry as well. I mean, you know, obviously Michelle Thompson and Natalie McGarry are completely different in terms of the outcomes of those things, but at the time of their suspension or them stepping down, it was, uh, you know, there was an investigation going on and there was no wrongdoing proven at that time. Um, obviously, Natalie McGarry was found to have done something wrong. Michelle Thompson was not. Um, and, you know, I think as um, Doogie was saying, would Nicola Sturgeon suspend herself? And, you know, from, from the actions previously, the answer is most certainly yes. And I think that's why there's people not just out with the SNP that you would expect to be saying these things, but within the SNP or who are saying, well, hold on a minute, 
we can't have one rule for one person and one rule for another. And it's especially when those rules were enacted by the person who now, you know, as they would say, should be suspended. It just seems very hypocritical. Um, you know, but the Michelle Thompson case certainly is an example of of hypocrisy if Nicola Surgeon is not suspended, I would say. Let's um, very briefly focus on one of the worst takes of the week, SNP MSP James Dornan. You were you weren't mad about this, Paul. He, he was he was not happy at you, Paul, at uh, all. Well, you know, I mean, this guy's got form for making moronic statements and then you know apologizing oh, that's, afterwards. That's not very nice. I mean, no, it's not, but it's also accurate. This is what he said. The fact that the media decided to make a big play of arresting the leader, the fact the police and the media seem to have some kind of collusion about making sure the media are in attendance when the slightest thing happens, it's like Fred West's house when they come look for a paper trail. I mean, where do you even start with that? Look, I think it would be foolish to try and, you know, dissect the mind of James Dornan you know, I don't think even a top psychologist could really take that on. But, um, I mean, all of this, you know, all of this stuff, the Sturgeon stuff and also the Boris stuff that I know we'll go on to talk about, it's all just becoming, I feel like we're in some sort of dystopian universe where the truth isn't really the truth and it's, it's very Trumpian and it's all conspiracies and... You know, the fact this nonsense about all oh, the police are colluding with the media. I mean, none of us had a clue what was going on. It's not like the, the Ian Livingston's like phoning us up going, oh, here, Nicholas about to be arrested. Make sure you're at this house. You know, Didn't, we, uh, didn't you get the call, Hannah? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, sorry. I, I, I must have missed that one. I was off on Sunday, obviously. Um, Do you, what do you make of Doran's comments? Fair <laughs> or is he a 24 carat fool? He, he is a 24 carat fool. We're, we're talking about a guy who thinks there's sectarian buses in Scotland. Um, so I, I, I think uh, that you, you know sums him up. It's quite a nasty attitude, I think. You know, this is all kind of fun and games, but you know, I, I still remember the way he tried to dismiss the attacks on Sarah Smith um, when she spoke about it, and, and he was very, you know, just come across a bitter little man. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just complete. It, it's just complete nonsense from a guy that, that doesn't know what he's talking about. I think there are many good SNP MSPs, many very talented ministers. Um, you know, and then yeah. there's James Dornan. Yeah. So, moving on from him, uh, unless you want to say something else, Hannah. Well, no. I just. I mean, I'm not. I just think like. Yeah, he says like really stupid things, but he actually does some decent stuff for his constituents. And at the end of the day, he's still an elected politician. Like uh, I think calling him a nasty little man and a carrot twenty four carrot fool. Come on. No, I think I think it's fine. Um, in a parliament of woes, honestly, in a parliament of woes, he's 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 right down there. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about another another headache for Hamza Yusuf, the Bells Hill by-election, Hannah, which I think is today. Yes, it's happening today. Um, now, obviously, this is this comes on the back of your scoops on the former SNP leader of the council, Jordan Linden. Could you just explain the background to this by-election, why it came about, and how you see it going today? Yeah, so, I mean, before I get into the background of it, it might seem... The reason why this is so significant is it's really the first sort of test of Hamza at the polls. We've not had, you know, there's not been any by-elections or whatever since Hamza took office until now. So even though it might seem like a kind of, oh, it's just a, a council by-election, it's actually, I think it'll be really interesting to see the results because if the SNP hold on to it, that will be incredible. But if they don't, it'll be interesting to see the kind of vote share and who, who wins. So um, the background, obviously, is, as we've been covering the Sunday Mail for the past year, actually, um, is Jordan London, the former North Lancashire Council leader and leader of the SNP group, um, 
you know, I uncovered some allegations that he had been basically be, been behaving inappropriately, kind of sec sexual harassment type um, behaviour towards uh, an SNP member a couple of years previously, and the party were aware of this, and they, by the looks of it, essentially tried to get the complainer to, um, you know, get it dealt with informally, no formal complaint um, registered. Jordan Linden went on to, to become leader of the council. Um, at that time, he was, this was 2019, at that time he was planning to stand for, for Westminster and I believe he dropped out four days after this incident. He dropped out of that contest. I'm not saying that they're connected in any way, but you can draw your own conclusions. Chronologically, there was a connection, yes. Yes, chronologically, there was a connection. Um, so that was 2019, but with the context of that, there, Jordan Linden had been a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament. There was allegations of inappropriate behaviour at that point as well with some people who were, you know, teenagers and some of them under the age of 16. Um, that seemed to have been dismissed as well at that time. And then reporting on all these things, I've obviously been in touch with other people who claim that they have been also sexually harassed by Jordan Linden um, at various points, including um, the sort of, the most recent one is um, a, a fellow SNP councillor who's actually, you know, he waived his right to anonymity and he came forward in the pages of Sunday Mail to tell us about a seven year campaign of harassment, which started with a an alleged sexual assault um, on a youth youth trip to uh, Barcelona. Um, and since then, the pair of them had been councillors in North Lancashire Council, and uh, he claims that he's been sexually harassed by Jordan London throughout that time. And what, do you, what do you think this scandal says or said about the SNP's complaints process? Oh, well, it says it's just a load of absolute rubbish. I mean, the complaints process in the SNP, this is a bit niche, I suppose, for people who are, are watching, but, you know, the complaints process within the SNP is ludicrous. They don't, at least they didn't, they've, they've done some changes recently, uh, but, you know, it just seems basically one guy is responsible for fielding complaints. He seems to decide what ones to take seriously and what not. You know, this person who's responsible for that is also very closely aligned to the party leadership. So if it's somebody that the party, you know, respects or is a big name in the party who, who it's going to look bad if the, if there's complaints about them. I'm not saying this has happened, but I'm saying, you know, you, you can imagine a series of events where they try and minimise or play down or, or, or redirect complainants elsewhere so they don't make a formal complaint etc um you know there's dozens of complaints that are just unanswered some of them very serious um you know the party have have completely dropped the ball on it i've done i've been covering this issue not just jordan linden but about complaints within the snp for years and i think a lot of it stems from the fact that after the referendum they ballooned in size so a party that was maybe 10,000 people and they all it was all very close knit and kind of you know they all knew each other and it was quite informal and they didn't need all these big processes they suddenly ballooned to 120,000 members and their processes were not suitable to cope with such a large organization and the sort of conflicts that come out around you know associated with that so okay, anyway. the, the backdrop, the backdrop to this by-election is a complete shit show and a shambles for the SNP. Is there a bit oh, of pressure? Yeah. Oh, on Labour? Yeah, I say that. Is there a bit of um, is there a bit of um, pressure on Labour to win? Well, what, yeah. what do you, yeah. What do you I think? Mean, do you? If they can't win this, you know, Lanarkshire Heartlands, a uh, traditional Labour Heartland, especially North Lanarkshire, uh, a, a by-election that's come about. Because of a you know alleged sex pest council, if Labour can't win this one, then I think all bets are off on what could happen because it's just been an absolute disaster for Labour. I I don't think that I think they will win, but 
I mean, they've already got the council, so I, you know, obviously, I think they're probably favourites. They'll be expecting to pick it up, but they don't have to win it, do they? Well, they don't need to win it from that point of view, but I think it's a, you know to build some momentum going forward. Uh, and I think there'll be suggestions if they can't win here. I, I think as well the margin might, even if it's tight, for, for, for me suggests that the polls might not be as accurate as maybe we think because North Lanarkshire is one of the places that are expected to go red, you know, in eighteen months' time. Um, if Labour limp over the line. I, I, because there's going to be an awful lot of people who aren't voting on party lines here or are voting for a party that they wouldn't necessarily vote for in an election because of the way the SNP have handled the situation locally. But when it comes to a Westminster election or a Holyrood election, they might, you know, vote differently. So I think Labour do need to win it. Uh, you know, obviously they don't need to win it to take control of the council. But in terms of moving forward, in terms of what it could mean over the next two years, then yeah, I think it's a, 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 a there is pressure on Labour to win. Okay, let's move on to one of the most venal and appalling men in public life, uh, Boris Johnson. Um, there has been the publication of the report by the Privileges Committee at Westminster today uh, into whether the former Prime Minister misled Parliament over COVID lockdown parties. And I think by common consent, it is one of the most damning reports uh, ever into an MP, certainly into a former Prime Minister. Um, he's been found in contempt of Parliament. Uh, the report found that uh, he deliberately misled MPs on the committee while we were investigating him, um, that he in, had impugned the committee in his criticism of it uh, and had been complicit in a campaign of abuse against its members. And they were going to recommend a 90-day sanction. Um, Dougie, the, the Express has been quite favourable towards Boris, but I mean, really, this just doesn't leave him with anything, does it? No, I, I think I think this is um, the end for Boris. I, I just don't see how he can come back from this. Uh, I think there's been some surprise about the uh, the sanction that would have been um, put down, but I don't think anyone's surprised about you know the result, as it were. Um, I know Boris has kind of said about, uh, you know, it was a kangaroo court and people had their minds made up beforehand. You know, there's probably an element of truth in that. People probably did have their minds made up beforehand, but I think this occasion, it's pro probably a case of two wrongs doing fact make a right. Uh, because, uh, you know, I've been on here before and in my in my personal opinion, you know, I think what he'd done was pretty unforgivable. Um, at the time, um, I was doing everything that was asked of me um, while well, he was bending the rules or breaking the rules. Um, it's, it, it's just such an absolute, you, you know, like you said, Paul, it's another shit show. So um, I think I think Rishi Sunak will be a happy man today. I think it gives him a chance to kind of press on with his own agenda now without Boris in the background, you know, the spectre of Boris. Boris's supporters will still be there, but you know, there's no way, there's absolutely no way back from this. I don't think that you know, been here before with him. He's 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 a political survivor, but I, I, I mean, like you say, Paul, I've always not had the chance to peruse the whole report, but uh, it, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, it's absolutely damning, and uh, um, I, I just don't know where they can go from here. Hannah, I suppose mm. the parallel that I would draw is that if you go back to the the riots on capitol hill the insurrection um which trump had a major hand in mm -hmm. and they went to i think uh impeachment hearings and then republican senators bottled it and now trump is trying to make a comeback so they had the chance to kind of um end trump's career and they didn't do it and now he's back do you think that sunak and the tories have a chance here to you know effectively ensure that there's no comeback ever for Boris? Um, well, that's a hard one because, yeah, they can say, you know, they can agree to what's contained within the report and I think there's some chat about removing them from um, not allowing them to have a, a 
former parliamentarians pass so that you can go and swan about in Westminster. I mean, I worked in the place for two years. I don't know why you would want to go and swan around in there. But anyway, um, you know, so yeah, they, they could do that. But I, I'm not entirely sure if they could prevent him, for example. I mean, I don't think they could prevent him from standing for like mayoral election again, for example, if he... Well, couldn't, was, couldn't, could, you know, given like... the. the couldn't the Tories, if this 90-day sanction is pushed through, couldn't the Tories basically say, we don't think you're a fit and proper person to stand under the Tory banner? Well, yeah, but the 90-day sanction isn't, that's invalid now because he's resigned. So they might yes, not vote on that. Was, they could still maybe uh, fall back on what the recommendation was. Um, they could say... Well, yeah, um, but that, I, suppose is... they, I suppose, you know, they, they kiboshed folk for less. You know, they will have stopped people from being candidates for a lot less than that damning report. Well, yeah, but I mean, I think you've got you're a little bit confused in terms of like the procedural mechanisms of Parliament that I won't bore you with. But you know, there's that side of it. Yeah, they can kind of try and prevent him from standing again in any capacity. But also, what if Boris Johnson was to form his own political party, yeah. which isn't actually beyond the realms of you know, comprehension, there's already talk of that kind of thing. And I could imagine him doing something like that. Um, you know, I think then he would be seen as more of like a kind of Nigel Farage figure. Uh, but he clearly, he's an absolute maniac. He's a pathological liar and a head case as far as I'm concerned. And he shouldn't be anywhere near politics. How he became prime minister, I have no idea. Um, you know, I mean, just like, being a, like I was in Westminster, covering Westminster for the entire entirety of the pandemic and watching him lie, as we now know, right in front of your face, so skilled at doing that, but you're just like, he's not this bumbling buffoon that he makes himself out to be. He's a very, very dangerous man and he should not be anywhere near political office ever again. I think it was... Is it the UK's lowest point of the last few decades that this clown ever became Prime Minister? Yeah. How about you, Dougie? <laughs> um, I, I, I think I think I think with hindsight, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Um, it's not worked out great for him. Uh, so let's hope it's the lowest point of the next twenty years. Uh, it may also this week as well. I, I, again, I've spoken about this before. This kind of cult of personality that gets behind people like Boris and behind people like Nicola Sturgeon. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe maybe we might start to see a bit of, a bit of a loosening in that, which which you know can only be a good thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you see it in other countries. You know, Biden defeats Trump. The SPD guy in Germany is considered to be quite a boring middle of the road guy. Maybe in countries there is just a sort of hankering for. Just a quiet professionalism over populism now. Yeah, I think Rishi Sunak's pretty boring. Yeah, yeah. Of course, he's never faced the voters. He's never been installed. It was, that was no mark from the Tory party. Right, so let's move on. Now. Let's move on. Good week, bad week. Let's start with you, Hannah. Who have you got? A uh, bad week is obviously Boris. Um, Slash, slash, of course, Nicola Sturgeon, but you know, Boris definitely just, just get him. In fact, just get him off the screen, get him away from me. I don't even want to look at his bloody face anymore. Um, and good week, I'm going to say good week for Labour actually, because the SNP is in tur turmoil. Uh, the Tories are, and you know, they're turning on each other. They're imploding, and really, Labour. As I say quite often, like Labour just has to be sensible, not do anything crazy, and hopefully things will be all right in 18 months' time or whenever the next general election is, and also maybe tonight at the by-election as well. Yeah, indeed. Dougie, you? Yeah, first, of all, first of all, stunned, stunned, Hannah, that you took Labour for the good week again. Um, it, it seems every week, you know. Wait, we're not having a good week. Wait, I'm not wearing this dress for nothing. In the Roger household. Uh, so for um, a bad week, uh, I've, I've gone, it's been a bad week for our, our Highland and Island communities. Um, 
obviously, with you know, the ongoing ferry fiasco, there was a protest in Eust, um I think it was last week, um, and obviously on Monday as well, uh, it looked like the SNP have delayed an announcement on when we might expect the A9 project to kind of kick on. Um, the A9, something I worked on when I was when I was at the Perthshire Advertiser, it's so important to communities up there, people's lives are at stake, and yet it, 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 it continually gets kicked into the long grass, I realise the SNP bring up you know, Brexit and COVID, but you know they made that 2025 vow in 2011, so uh, I don't really think that washes. Um, for good week, I, I've got it's been a good week for political conspiracy nuts who have get just so many, so many going about. Uh, you know, Nicola Sturgeon's arrest is 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 the act of MI5. Boris has been stitched up for um, uh, you know party gate, and then you've got another side as well. You know. You know, did they arrest Sturgeon because because Boris was in trouble, or did they did, did, did they do it to get you know because Boris was on the front page? I've, I've, I've sorry, I've heard so many. It's just um, nuts, and it was obviously we've had James Dornan indulging in it as well. So, um, but sorry, Hannah, I won't I won't um, get torn into Dornan anymore. But yeah, no, I'm not like I'm not like a big I'm not like James Dornan's best pal or anything. I just thought it was like a little bit of a personal attack. Is that his fan club badge? I see the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've got no. my membership card in next door. <laughs> no, but yeah, it's it's been a great week for them, and and and, and they're having a whale of a time on social media, and it's given me uh, a pretty good laugh. So yeah, well, it's I, I, I followed most of these conspiracy theories, and like, see if I ever won the lottery, I would buy a place in Mallorca, and I would delete my Twitter account, and it would never return. Just yeah. So done with the nonsense on that toxic hell site. Um, but, hey it's really, I find it quite scary though, the fact that, you know, obviously there's some totally off the wall conspiracies, but then you've got some of them that kind of managed to wheedle their way into some sort of mainstream thinking. Of course, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's some places, Twitter, I, I just wanted a week off it. And if you ever get the chance uh, to take a week off it, I thoroughly recommend it. It's it's good for the soul. Mm. Excellent. Okay, let's wrap it up then. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the James Dornan Boris Johnson special on Planet Hollywood. Um, thanks to Hannah and to Doogie for their uh, first class analysis, and I hope to see you again next week. Think of it's important we look at the facts. Yeah. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal.